Hello, and welcome to Walter Fun Filter. So happy you're able to join us for our podcast. You can uh, tell your friends to add us via their favorite podcast app. Give us a five star rating. Just enjoy the show. Today is special. William Byron, not only because he's a NASCAR Xfinity champion, three poles in 2019 in the Cup Series, but because he's my daughter's classmate. <laughs> yep, that's right. He and Macy went to high school together. We'll talk about their relationship, everything that's gone into getting William Byron at the age of 21 to the Cup Series, to the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series, driving for Hendrick Motorsports and Chad Knauss. Who are his heroes? What are some of his favorite memories of NASCAR? We're going to talk about all those things, and we're going to do it right now. Hey, Scott, all be ready. Green flag, green flag. All clear, buddy, all clear. Thank you, William, for coming to the yeah. Plus Studios here at Fox Sports for the Michael Waltrip Unfiltered yeah. podcast. Appreciate you joining me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. been fun. How do you like my studio? I like it. I was looking at your pumpkin over here, yeah. and I was wondering what that's all about. But I like the uh, – you got some cool helmets here. I mean – That some... one kind of freaks people out. Yeah, that one's weird. That I did. I just noticed that. That's weird. <laughs> that's a, that's exactly the only way to describe that. So the the reason why I have that is it was a Toyota commercial a hundred years ago, and okay. I don't even really know why I had on some weird suit and that helmet. Is that you? That's uh, supposed to be no, you? it's not. No. Oh. <laughs> I I don't know the answer to that, but I don't have a receding hairline, and that cat does. <laughs> that's odd. <laughs> yeah, that's. Even- even the eyeballs for air vents, that's yes. a little bit odd. Yeah. But. My favorite mm. helmet of the, well, I don't know. I can't pick a favorite. I like the way, I actually raced in that thing in 1988. Yeah. So that's why my head doesn't work as <laughs> as good as. <laughs> is that when you, is that that crash? No. Was that, that no? Ah. That, that one's. crash is right here. Oh, wow. And look. A little more safety there. I'll show that you helmet. something that's really cool. The best we can figure out. Is that's where one of the tires hit me in the head? Oh my god! During that crash, so that that's unreal. A, that's that's a great helmet. Wow! I'm thankful for that helmet. That's did that have a visor on it or just no? You no. wore uh, bubble goggles. Bubble goggles, right? So that's we awesome. went from that was '88. Look at the progress. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a, '90. So only in only two years we were able to get that much safer. That's awesome. That's a big, big improvement. Those are like Days of Thunder helmets. Yes. I like those. So you can see Cole. Yeah, I like those. Uh, my, my early career, I talk about 1981, which mm-hmm. was when I raced at the local short track in Kentucky. And something I've been really wanting to ask you because, you know, I know your history and everybody knows you grew up uh, in, in Charlotte and mm-hmm. somehow was a kid in your neighborhood that started to like racing when probably not a whole yeah. lot of the other kids did, right? Yeah, not really. Most of my, most of my friends were um, either playing football or they were um, playing video games or out in the backyard throwing, you know, or playing hockey. Even street hockey was a big thing, but fo- uh, racing was never a big thing around me. But uh, so everyone kind of thought I was weird. You know, they were like, "Man, why is this kid like this so much?" And he, I would always take everything so serious when it came to to racing, but I just loved it. Yeah, and your dad took you to Martinsville. Is that your first yeah. taste of competition? Do you remember what yeah. year that was? Uh, two thousand five. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was a while. I mean, it was uh, a while back for me in my racing years, but I uh, just remember being there in the stands and um, getting a headset and listening to like Jimmy or or Tony Stewart. It was it was just a lot of fun. It was uh, it was a cool experience. Now, I, when I was a kid, the thing I was going to ask you: when I was a kid, I, everybody around me because my brother, you know, raced. Everybody mm-hmm. knew I, I was all about racing. Yeah. And <laughs> and I wanted to be a racer so bad, and I just I didn't know how I was going to get that chance, but I, certainly that's what I wanted to be. And I remember as like a 12-year-old thinking, I'm going to be a race car driver, mm-hmm. but I'd never driven anything. And then yeah. I remember being f- afraid as a kid, like, what if I'm no good at it? Right. <laughs> you put yeah. a whole lot well, of... Well, you had pressure because yeah. you're a brother and everything. Right. Probably. A, yeah. a pressure, yeah, but also just... Wanting it so bad, but yeah. having no idea if I could do it or not. Yeah. And and I wanted to ask you, because of your video game playing, and did you ever wonder, you know, I'm pretty good at this on a video game, but yeah. can I drive? <laughs> yeah, I was really nervous. Like, what if this doesn't work out? Or what if I, what if the thing that I love so much I can't do or be a part of? And I didn't. A lot of people are like, you know, so I kind of came up with backup plans in my head. So I was like, okay, well, if I'm not good at driving, I'll be a part of NASCAR and I'll be in 
the part of the race team. Maybe I'll be, but I don't know a lot about cars. So maybe I'll be like on the marketing <laughs> side. So I just didn't know. Like I, I was like trying to come up with a backup plan of like, what if this doesn't work? And, um, but really there was no pressure for me to race. It was just internal pressure and motivation to try to be good at it. Well, it was something that you and your, your dad did together, which it's mm-hmm. really cool. You know, a lot of, a lot of dads take their kids fishing or, or golfing or whatever, but yeah. you guys decided you would go racing. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. I mean, it was like, my mom's always a little jealous cause she's like, man, you, your relationship with your dad grew so much in racing. And, uh, you know, up until I was like 13 or 14 years old, I was just, watching races and dad and I would go to like eight or nine races a year and um and that would be it and uh you know when we started racing I started traveling with him almost every weekend of the year and uh so we had a lot of conversations and tough conversations of like well what happens if like I can't do this or I can't get to the next level or I don't have the support to get to you know a late model like there were tough conversations of like well you know, I've won these races in legend cars, but like, what do you do next? Like, how do you get connected? You know, and, and luckily, um, drove for Dale Jr.'s team and things like that worked out, but it's, um, but I learned a lot from my dad. Yeah. Uh, you had to tell your mom, she has Catherine, you know, so mm-hmm. the, your dad, had, <laughs> yeah. your dad needed you for a few years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what great mentors you've had. Your father, obviously, Bill is, is a great man and, and has just mentored you perfectly uh, yeah. up, up the ladder, but getting to learn from from Dell Jr. And, and racing for Kyle Busch mm-hmm. and eventually Mr. Hendrick. I mean, those are some great minds to yeah. lean on when it comes to uh, making the next step in NASCAR. Yeah, they all had their differences for sure. I mean, Kyle, you know, what I learned from Kyle was that all that really matters is what's on track, right? You know, competition, winning, you know, that's what makes your, your paycheck or that's what gets you to the next level. Dell Jr. was, you know, how, what can you do off the track to – to further yourself how can you improve your relationship with your sponsors and your team so um and then mr h is kind of a combination of everything he just he's like a father to me he kind of he kind of lets me do my thing and then calls and checks in every now and then and um and he's always watching every little detail so there are a lot of differences in the three of those guys but it was cool to learn from them all do you remember the first time after your um online racing that that it was finally time i mean it was a, there was a or car there and yeah you're gonna you're gonna get in it and go see what you got <laughs> it was wild it was uh, was it at charlotte it was at charlotte yeah i i went to the that fifth mile track outside of yeah. uh, turn outside of the back stretch um that used to be a sinkhole it used to have all these bumps and that's when i raced it was when it was like a 12 foot downhill like run into turn three really fast and uh they they warned me of like guys going off the track there and all this stuff so i just my dad like just basically was like hey like go do this driving school um if you want to see if you can do it and um so i got out there and i did not know how to use a clutch i had no idea how to put on a fire suit gloves helmet all that stuff everything felt like it was a lot for me and i just so you know i had no help like my dad knew nothing and he just kind of let me go do my own thing so i felt really vulnerable and I could never get the car to start and push and use the clutch correctly, but once I got going, I was pretty fast. So it was kind of a crazy turn of events. When when you came in the first time and you <laughs> you know nothing, like you said, and you're, yeah. you feel vulnerable and you're you're naive and and everybody's like, you know, yeah. once, once you were was, able to get going, you're actually pretty pretty fast, kid. That yeah. had to be the best feeling in the world. It was cool. I mean, everyone looked at me like, oh man, he's gonna crash this thing, and like <laughs> he doesn't even know. I kept, you know stalling it and it kept bogging and um once I got out there it was just like wow you know and people kept looking over at me they were like so it was funny you know how racing is like everyone thinks their kid's gonna be the next biggest thing so there was like this one kid who raced dirt and he was there and he had an agent like already and the agent is like sitting there and he's an agent of like multiple cup drivers and and so he comes over and talks to me about you know how I did and that was kind of the first sign of like wow okay maybe Maybe I'm okay or I'm doing all right. So I had people to compare it to, which was good. And this was uh, 2010, 12? Is that where we yeah, are Yeah, right probably now? 2012. Right on. Yeah. And that led to racing and winning at the quarter mile inside the Charlotte Motor Speedway mm-hmm. in your Legends cars. How long yeah. did it take the success in the Legends cars? Uh, did you go traveling off yeah. other tracks with your car? Yeah, I did. Yeah, Dennis Lambert, who... Um, 
who is a big mentor of mine, he was driving me to every race. So uh, we'd get in the car and road trip to New York. And um, the furthest we went was Vegas. You know, we drove, he drove the cars out there to Vegas and we raced out there. And um, it was wild. I mean, just learning from him and like understanding his racing background because he's a really good driver. You know, there's uh-huh. always that guy you kind of grow up with that you're like, man, if he could ever make it, he'd be really good. So he was that guy for me. So, um, I learned a lot driving around with him to each track. And and that tra- those travels you you won everywhere you went, is that fair to say? Um, I mean for the most part, like the southern places it was weird. When I went to all the southern tracks, we had it figured out and I would if I raced at uh not Riverside, but um Southside Speedway up in Virginia, which I think's Denny Hamlin's mm-hmm. local track and that you know, I did well at all those local, you know, Virginia south carolina all those tracks but then we went up north and we had this trip and we went for like a whole week and we were racing seven times and we were supposed to win like hopefully five or (laughs) five or six of those well we won none of them and we crashed and we had terrible runs like all the tracks until the final day and we finally won that race but um so it was tough i mean depending on the geography of where you went it was different and and do you do you think that it's because the atmosphere the temperature the humidity it just drove differently or just bad luck uh a little bit of bad luck like the tracks were different the tracks up north had a lot more grip so the tracks down south were really slick and worn out and uh the tracks up north had a lot of grip so a lot of guys were fast and so it was harder if you didn't have a good draw for your heat race you didn't get through traffic as well and we didn't know the setup for the tracks like everyone um ran different springs and shocks and um, you know, different engines. There weren't a lot of rules up north. That's what I learned. So <laughs> it was kind of whatever big engine you wanted. And so it made it tougher. I remember when I was a kid, this is how stupid I was. I was going on a Greyhound bus to Nashville, Tennessee, because uh, mom and dad, they they said, we don't have time for this. And mm-hmm. my brother Bobby lived in Nashville, and he said, you can drive my go-kart if you can get down here. So yeah, on a Greyhound bus, I went. <laughs> That's awesome. And, Going down there, I'm, I remember looking at my feet, and I'm like, this one's the gas, and this one's the brake, but what if I forget when I get nervous, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I wrote a big yeah. G on my foot uh, That's good. For, for gas. I knew that one was one that make, made me go. When you when re- racing those Legends mm-hmm. cars and, and the success you had, but when it was time to transition from a Legends car into a real stock car, mm-hmm. another big step, were you confident by that time? Did you yeah. think, wow, actually, I think I can do this too? Yeah, I mean, it was a weird transition, like... The first time I got in a late model, you know, the guys were like, oh, man, you're really fast and you're doing everything well. But then you got to learn how to save tires and you got to learn how to manage your stuff and manage the other competitors. And everything came really easy at first. Like I finished second in my first race ever in a late model. What, it was a, what track? Uh, Hickory. Mm-hmm. And I was um, it was a big field like it was uh, one of those hundred lap races and beginning of the year. And um, but it got a lot tougher through the summer. And I really struggled. I mean, just to give feedback on the car during daytime when it's really slick and then how does that translate to night um and i just struggled with that whole transition so and plus racing people i wasn't aggressive like enough like i was trying to give people too much room and all that stuff so you don't see much of that anymore yeah (laughs) so that was tough and i kind of um it was like i had to go through that transition of kind of building up some uh some i guess thick skin to kind of learn what what it takes to to compete so I think that's interesting what you said about saving your tires because as a kid you just want to go and you want to go as mm-hmm. fast as you can and it takes a mentor like like your crew chief Lambert to, to yeah. explain things to you so that you can understand the result. Uh, I remember my first K N race uh, was like in 2012, mm-hmm. 11 or 12 out in Montana, yeah. and it was a 150 lapper. Yeah, and I started sixth. And on like lap ten, I took the lead. Yeah. And I led. I was hauling around the top of the racetrack, and I got passed for the lead on lap fifty one. I think I got lapped on lap seventy one. Oh no! I said I don't have any tires left. And they said, Well, you can't have any more. That's that's yeah, really that's tough. It. That yeah. takes a lot of discipline. It does, and it's like it's one of those skills that in the Cup Series, at least, it only happens at certain tracks. I mean, the Cup Series, you go as hard as you can. Bristol you know, uh, Chicago, all these places where you just drive it to the, to its limit. Then you go to Martinsville and you're like, man, I got to do both. I got to drive hard for the first 10 laps. And then I got to figure out how to save the yeah. rear tires or Sonoma. So, uh, it's tough. I mean, you got to kind of balance that. I thought I always respected Denny Hamlin at those tracks you're speaking of, because mm-hmm. I would watch 
uh, as a TV guy, and he, he would just stay far enough at the head, ahead of the guy behind him early in those runs yeah. to, to not to go as fast as he needed to. Yeah. But was, he was smart enough to know that that was going to pay off in the end, and next time you look up, there's nobody behind him anymore. Yeah. And those you, you, you've obviously learned from some of the best, but that, that's yeah. a that's an interesting um, dynamic to go just as fast as you have to so you can yeah. go fast longer. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it, I don't think – Denny's the, one of the best at it. I mean, I would say Denny or Jeff Gordon. Um, you know, I rode in a two-seater with Jeff Gordon and just watched how he managed and how he just was so good on the brakes and so good on corner exit just being as straight as possible. It was like it was like he found a point in the, in the track that he was going to go to, and then he was just going to get in the gas, same point every lap. So uh, it was crazy to kind of watch that from him. What was it like for you as a kid to, to – have so much success early on and and now you're you're riding with Jeff Gordon and he's helping you or you're yeah. you're sitting in a meeting with Dale Jr. Kyle Busch uh was that overwhelming or did you just understand that this was your your path and that's what how it was going to be yeah it it's kind of taken me some time each year of my career to get comfortable with people and um Chad made that comment you know Chad can my crew chief now he's like man it took you a little bit to for you to like be up front with me and be direct and it it just, I don't know why it's just a, it's probably a shock of like having somebody that you've always looked up to, or you've watched on TV and then going and racing them or, or being a part of their team. So it took me a while with Kyle Bush. It took me a while with Dale, um, Mr. H, you know, but, um, you kind of build that trust and ability to where you kind of put your wall down and you can speak. Yeah. And, and they have to understand that at this point, you said it took you a while. You were, you, you were a rookie in trucks, and then you were a rookie in Xfinity, and then you were you didn't have that next year. Then you were a rookie mm-hmm. in Cup. Yeah, that that didn't take yeah. too long of a while. Yeah, it did <laughs> not not by uh, I guess not by like time standards, but it in mental standards. I guess it everything in my career feels like it's like weird because this is the first year in my career that things feel like they go fast because I guess I've settled into an environment. Everything else has felt really slow and really. Um, progressing, I guess. So this year has felt fast because it's just I've been in the same environment. It's the first time I go to a driver's meeting and I'm like, oh yeah, I've heard this before. Yeah. It's like <laughs> <laughs> I go to Chicago, I'm like, oh yeah, I've heard, I've heard about don't go below the white line before the start finish, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's like you're not a rookie this year, and I was looking at some of your stats, and and half the races in 2019, you've already led three times the amount of laps that you did all of last year. Mm-hmm. So obviously, it's it's progressing and tracking in the right direction mm. when i when i talk about your truck series rookie season um seven wins and and nearly won the championship and xfinity you win the championship um what were your expectations in yeah. 2018 when you came to cup because you you were beating these guys on saturday that you're mm. gonna have to race on sunday did yeah. you think that 2018 had the 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 possibility of of the same sort of yeah. winning and successes. Yeah, I was I was very naive when it came to <laughs> learning what the Cup Series was going to be like. I think, um, you know, I I think I, I it's safe to say I thought I'd run the way I did this year last year I guess. Um, and I think there's a lot of factors in that. You know, I wasn't experienced. I didn't know what to uh, how to give feedback. What was important? What wasn't important? Um, you know, I was really bad on pit road. I was really made a lot of mistakes on restarts, you know, made a lot of mistakes crashing, you know, all that stuff that like it, you take for granted. Cause like you know, in the Xfinity series, if you're running seventh, you know, it's, it's an okay day. Like you're going to be fine in the cup series. You're struggling. If, if you're struggling, you're about to get lapped yeah, and, and you're running 27th. Yeah. And you're running 25th. Yeah. 27th. You're fighting with guys. So, um, it became tough to just learn how do I just kind of calm down and how can I maybe gain spots on pit road that will not allow me to push it too hard and hit the wall and, and destroy our car. So I kind of learned those things. I was with your dad the other day when, when uh, you were racing in Chicago and, and you, you had a great run, led some of the race and, and, and was very competitive. And I, I, I just overheard his phone ring and the first thing you said is, "I got to get better on restarts." Yeah. I could tell him, I could hear him say, "Oh, son, you're 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 gonna get it." How is there any way to tell yeah. people at home? Not only, I mean, 
the, the, the technique and the tactics yeah. that all go on on those restarts that mm-hmm. when you're looking at it on TV, you just look like they all take off. But it's, <laughs> it's far from that. Yeah. You got to multitask, I guess. You got to, you know, you, you've got to, nowadays with this package, you've got to maybe be waving the guy behind you to push or um, while you're trying to shift gears. So you're holding the wheel with one hand and you're, you're kind of off center and a lot of things going on. You're looking in your mirror, your right side mirror or your outside mirror to kind of see where that guy is off your right rear. Um, so there's all these factors and then you've, you're listening to a spotter too. So he's telling you, Oh, you're clear by two, three, whatever, or you're inside, you've got two cars inside of you. So you got to multitask really well. And, um, the only thing I've found that's helped is just, um, just eye racing, really. I mean, trying to do more restarts on eye racing and uh, that that and, really yeah pertains to what you do in real life. Yeah, I think so because it's um, you know the only thing that's not the same is sitting in the cockpit and being enclosed, but um, it's just that that quick thought process kind of helps. Now, look, it appears from someone that hadn't raced in, in a couple of years that mm-hmm. that line when you're able to accelerate mm-hmm. is uh, it it's really key to maybe get going a little bit before someone else Yeah, does. exactly. <laughs> and I know that's a fine yeah. line to, to walk, but yeah. uh, talk about how, if, if especially if you're leading, how you play that line and what that line means to you. Yeah, that's funny. That's a, so Max Pappas is a good, you know, friend of mine and also a mentor. So he raced a go-kart race the other week and he was qualified on the pole and he's like, he went to the race director and said, hey, how do, how do I start this race? I've never raced in this series. What's going to happen? Flag, he's like, flagman's going to have a flag in his hand. As soon as he starts to lower the flag is when you go. So Max is like, okay, perfect. So he's like lining up. They're too wide. He's looking at the guy. He waits for him to lower it. And he's, cars are going by him. <laughs> like he's already eighth place on lap one. So he's like, he goes to the race director. He's like, are you kidding me? Like I did exactly what you said to do. And he's like, yeah, well, you know. Sometimes they leave soon. Sometimes they leave early. <laughs> and so the next day he left early. But it's kind of, you know, you got to ask for mercy and not permission, I guess. But uh, it's part of part of racing. It's always been that way. Yeah. Um, speaking of, we've, we've progressed so quickly through your career, the, the seven wins in the Truck Series rookie season. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that, that um, pertain to three of your best or favorite moments. Mm-hmm. As a kid, who were your three favorite racers? Who'd you look up to and, and try to race like even? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, this is kind of a obvious answer, I guess, but Jimmy Johnson was a big, big deal for me. He was, um, you know, I watched him in 2003 was the first time I was six years old, and I watched him, and it was, I think it was his second year in Cup, and he was racing with Jeff Gordon, and I wanted to say it was like Chicago or something. And um, he was right there. Like, he was like, or he was beating Jeff, I think. And my friends were all like, man, I like Jeff Gordon. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's the obvious answer. Like, he's the man. Like, he's won, you know, 80-something races already. Um, But Jimmy was the guy that was beating him. And I was like, wow, that guy looks, he looks pretty awesome. And I liked the way the 48 car looked with the black. And and it was just, it was just kind of a match right away yeah and you couldn't pick a better guy not only on the track but off the track as well he's a yeah, yeah Jim, jimmy and jeff both are great guys to look up to so jimmy's number yeah. one who's number two and three yeah number two and three um i would say these are more immediate guys that were kind of along my racing once i started racing and i gained appreciation but two would be kyle bush you know he just i was amazed when i got to kbm the way he processed things and um what he did just made sense the way he managed people and he's harsh, but, um, that's okay. I mean, I think that's kind of what's needed sometimes. And then three would be Lee Pulliam cause I raced against him and, um, you know, Lee Pulliam and Josh Berry would kind of be right there for me. But Lee was somebody that was just the man in, in late models. He won so many races, so many championships and he had a backbone. Like he always, you know, he, he would crash somebody after the race, which was like <laughs> kind of crazy to watch. But, um, he was just really talented, and uh, he was appreciative too. Yeah, did you? Uh, did you ever? Do you remember the first time you beat him, or passed him, or racing with him? That had to be a big yeah. moment for you, looking up to him like you did. Yeah, yeah. I, I never. I mean, I beat him. I never beat him for a win. I think I finished second at South Boston. He finished fourth. Um, you know, but I I passed him, and I racing door to door with him at Motor Mile a couple times. And Josh was the same way. I mean, Josh, I looked up to because he worked on my cars and. Um, he taught me a lot. So those two guys, I was always 
like side by side with, and I knew I was having a good day if I did that. Yeah, and those those guys um, are still at it today, mm-hmm. winning races and and yeah. uh, doing what they love to do. Yeah, their paths have have uh, pretty much kept them in late models where you've you've progressed. And I, mm-hmm. I wanted to share with you my three favorite um, William Byron moments, and yeah. uh, I want to see how they differ from yours. And okay. I know they're going to be quite different <laughs> because I haven't That's known cool. I haven't known you <laughs> since the beginning, but. Yeah. I, I just remember your uh, your first win at Kansas, and yeah. you avoided a, a, a wreck. But uh, yeah. I think, see, see if my facts are right. Didn't you get loose underneath someone a couple of weeks before in a truck race and, and maybe spin out or, or – Yeah. I just – Oh, I, yeah. Well, my first start in trucks, I got um, – I crashed. Yeah, Phoenix. Yeah. I, I was not – like I qualified well and then I went backwards and then I ended up getting involved in a crash. And so, and Kansas, I think was like my fifth truck race. And so, you know, I think like, I was like, wow, to come from there and then to win a race was pretty big. Yeah. I remember that because uh, Macy, my daughter, Macy went, went to school with, yeah. with William. Uh, they were both in the same grade. And I remember that because you were racing in the, in the late models and it was announced that you were going to go truck racing in 2016. Mm-hmm. And she, she called me and said, dad, one of my f- high school classmates yeah. is going to race NASCAR. Is, <laughs> is he any good? I said, well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, yeah. he's, he's done pretty good so far, but, um, yeah, it, it was really fun for me to call her that night and tell her you had won. Yeah. And, and I, awesome. and I told her also, I said, it, it appears that that he is pretty good. <laughs> That's <And> awesome. <laughs> she was really happy. So that yeah. that win was my my favorite cool. early memory of you. Yeah. My second favorite memory was the what happened to you at Phoenix after mm-hmm. winning um, six races up to that point in the season. It was the last, yeah. next to the last race of the year. You're you're in control of the championship, mm-hmm. and you're leading Phoenix by a lot. Yeah. And your engine blew up. Yeah. And just the just the way you handled yourself. I mean, that was, was bitter disappointment, but mm-hmm. you know, you didn't blame anyone. You said, we'll go get them next week. And I'll be darned. Yeah. You went and got them next week, but <laughs> unfortunately yeah. it wasn't for the championship. Yeah. That's, that was kind of a, that was a real disappointing time of my life. I mean, I, you know, when you have something like that happen, um, you know, your ceiling is only, you know, you try to make your ceiling really high. So you just don't know what you can accomplish. So you're like, man, I won a couple of races. Maybe I can win more. Maybe I <laughs> won six. Maybe I can win a championship. So like, um, but then I guess for me, I've always kind of taken things responsibly. And I thought, man, maybe I did something wrong. Like maybe I, you know, did, maybe I didn't turn the switches off right or, or something. And once I got reassurance that I did all that stuff fine, then it was just disappointment. But, um, that was tough. I mean, then to go the next week and win was, was definitely cool. Yeah. And then uh, my favorite William Byron moment, and, and it wasn't when you won the Xfinity Championship, which was an awesome yeah. accomplishment, a great race. But uh, mm-hmm. this is more on the personal side, was when um, you sat on the pole for the 600 and yeah. led that race. And I had at least 10 of your classmates <laughs> on a bus yeah. in the infield with my daughter. And they're yeah. all cheering you on. I got a great video of them. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and they're just... They were so naive. They're like, William's beating everybody. And I said, <laughs> yeah. that's our guy right there. It just was so special to see those those young adults, uh, college yeah. kids, en- enjoying <laughs> what you were what, what, enjoying what you were doing. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. I love that because like you, all through high school, you're just trying to impress your peers because you just want to be the most popular kid, or you just want to be like a popular kid, and then. Um, you know, life goes on, you kind of like everyone goes their separate ways, but it was cool to have everyone back at the race like that. And, um, it was awesome. I mean, I never mentioned my racing to Macy growing up in high school. Cause I just felt embarrassed. I'm like, Michael's up there in the cup series and I'm in late models. And like, I need to get to a certain point and maybe then I can talk about it. But, um, it's cool how it came full circle. And, and I got a lot of buddies that text me after every race and Macy does, and just people watch it now. It's pretty cool. You didn't ever go on a date with her, did you? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I'll make sure. Um, where, where did this? So those are my favorite William Byron moments. What, what are, yeah. what are the ones that stick out to you? And, and that's from the beginning. What, 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 what yeah. makes you smile the most? Uh, I mean, you had some good ones there. I would say, um, first legend car win was number one because you just don't know if you're going to be able to win. Like you just. 
you're like, man, I finished second. I know what it's like to follow somebody, but what's it like to lead? Like, what is it like if I get out front? And I was so nervous. I was like, I'm, I felt like I missed every corner of every <laughs> lap and I won the race. And it was like this big burden was lifted off my shoulders. Um, and then, so I was one at number two would probably be, uh, the seventh win in the truck series, winning that race at Homestead. No rookie had ever done that. Yeah. Really? I no, didn't know that. I think five cool. was the record before that. Yeah. That was, so that just winning seven, like the number seven was awesome. It was, um, you know, it was kind of, uh, Homestead's a tough track. You know, Larson was in the race. Not that I beat him really head up, heads up like that, but, um, just to have some cup guys in the race was cool. Um, number three, that's a, that's a tough one. I would say, um, what about when you beat Bubba for that pass into the all-star race? Yeah, that had to be, that, that was, was, that, that was, was drama, cool. wasn't it? That was cool. That was probably the number one moment from the cup series so far, because the all-star race was the coolest race as a kid. Cause I grew up in Charlotte and, um, you know, it stinks when you're not part of that race because yes. you got to go sit at home or you go to the lake, you try to make yourself feel better, do something, but you know, other, everybody else is racing. Uh, so to be part of that race was definitely number one in the cup series for me. Well, and it's funny you say that because I, re- I won the all-star race in 96 yeah. and I, I had qualified for it through the, the open or the, whatever that race is called mm-hmm. every time I'd ever been in the all-star race. Cause I hadn't won an official race yet, but I felt the same way. It's like, you won't, yeah. you don't want to let your team down. Right, you, you darn sure don't want to let Chad Knauss down. Right, you know you don't want to let those guys that work so hard on your car. Yeah, I wanted to be a part of the big show, right. and the big show was the All Star race, and mm-hmm. and and a lot of just that accomplishment, putting it just feels so good for your team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like you belong. I guess like I have, I I had up to that point done nothing but finish in the top ten a few times in the Cup Series, and to feel that moment of like, man, I belong, like go out there in the race and there's not a bad car out there. There's not a bad driver. Like you're racing against Kurt Busch and, and, you know, um, Jimmy Johnson, all these guys. So, um, it was kind of that first moment, like, Oh, maybe I belong in the cup series. Yeah. And then you follow that up with a strong 600. And, and like you said, now things start to become feeling more normal being up front. And yeah. that's a, that's a great place to find yourself. And, mm-hmm. and with, with, um, Bowman winning and and the speed that Jimmy has shown and yeah. and a second place finish in yeah. the Coke Zero Sugar 400 Saturday Sunday afternoon in Daytona. Yeah, um, tell tell me a little bit about your Daytona experience. Yeah, and it's okay <laughs> if you start right there with the the Thursday afternoon practice uh, yeah. skirmish with with Brad. That that didn't mm. really make a whole lot of sense to me, but mm. I don't know what 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 you see. <clears throat> yeah, I um so. Going down to Daytona, it's always a fun time. Like July Fourth is really cool, so I get excited about that. Um, we had a good result in the, or we had a good result going in the 500. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm all thinking about that, trying to like learn and practice, try to get better. Um, obviously, Brad, you know, felt like last year I pulled a block that was that was unacceptable or whatever. And so, um, with us racing and practice like we were, you know, trying to learn. Um, you know, I was, I was expecting to be raced hard, but I didn't really expect that. So that was a little bit of a surprise, but, um, I was impressed by how my team rallied and brought up the backup car, worked all night to get that one ready. And, um, you know, just, I was really impressed with how we handled the adversity, I guess, yeah. and to come home second after that whole weekend, like it was, uh, was really awesome. Cause it could have easily der- derailed everything that we had going, uh, where we were in points, you know, 12th in points, we could have moved four or five spots just in that race. Um, so we gained points on the weekend and, um, just kind of took a bad situation and made it a lot better. Did the sophomore William Byron go find Brad Kozlowski, the, the, <laughs> the cup yeah. champion and say, man, uh, talk to me. What, what I do wrong here? Or, or how did this go down? Yeah. Yeah. We talked, we talked because I felt like, you know, initially I texted him, and I was like, man, it just doesn't sit well with me still. Like, I, I got to understand where he's coming from. And I feel like he's got to understand where I'm coming from. Because if he, if I go out there and one day, you know, wreck him, let's say, and, you know, and, and he's like, well, man, you never came and talked to me. You know, you just hid in your bus or whatever and you went away. I feel like that would be really bad. So I tried to go talk to him and learn where he's coming from. And I feel like, um, you know, I got to approach it that way because I'm, part of the cup series and if i want to be around for a while i gotta get to know these guys yeah i appreciate that attitude too because i, I know that um 
Dale Earnhardt would have never texted somebody and told them he was upset. He would, yeah. he would go see them and and face to face with another driver, another racer. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's certainly the a, a great way to handle that. And yeah. you walk out of there feeling better or the same, still yeah. confused or whatever <laughs> exactly. happens. At least you gave it a shot. Right. Yeah. At least you got face to face. Like, um, you know, I can't stand not getting face to face and having that awkward thing go down the road like it is. Um, you gotta. I think guys gotta talk it out more. So um, that's good. Well, we saw a wild 400 there in Daytona. What would you think about the the race in general? How was your day going up mm-hmm. until the, the, I guess, the big crash was yeah. sort of the, the turning point in that whole whole race? Yeah, it was. I mean, we started um, we started last, you know, because we had to go to the back. Um, and it was I, tough to work up. I wonder, What's that? your car yeah. didn't look that tore up. Your team, I know they, they yeah. obviously said, we're going to get a backup car out. What, yeah. How how'd you feel about that? Yeah, I was disappointed because I was like a pride thing. I was like, man, come on. Like, I need <laughs> the primary car. I need to go back out there and, and like, you know, stick up for myself type thing. But, um, you know, put the ego aside for a minute. The car was pretty torn up, hitting off the apron. The nose was bent up because the splitter, you know, got on the apron pretty hard. And um, the right rear had some damage from contact, too. So um, it was a tough decision, but it kind of made sense. You know, our backup cars are really good, thankfully. So, um, you know, that, that made sense for us, but, um, starting in the back handling was a big deal in the first stage, you know, being back there in dirty air, um, the cars were moving around a lot. So, um, we got to the front, we got to second or third, um, and we were on the bottom lane there and I was behind chase and, um, Austin Dillon was, um, ahead of chase and Denny was the leader and the outside lane was coming hard. So Austin went up to defend that. And then, um, by the time he defended that, I, I kind of noticed he was moving around So I kind of lifted a little bit early, and luckily it just worked out. Actually, Chase was the last car to get hooked into the the crash. Yeah, that was a major crash, and it came from blocking. Talk talk to me. My strategy or my thoughts toward blocking is you don't block to keep a guy behind you necessarily. Mm -hmm. You block to get his run, to to get that push so you continue to be be Mm -hmm. out in front. Be a leader. After what happened on Thursday and then after you saw – what happened between Clint and Austin there, mm-hmm. uh, where where do you stand on all this talk about blocking? Because everybody act like almost, not everybody, a lot of people are mm-hmm. acting like this just has started. But it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been, been around forever. It's been I around. used to deal with it right. all the time. Right, yeah, it's been around. I mean, I remember y'all's races when the yellow line wasn't a rule. Guys would just block all the way to the infield. Yeah. I mean, like, the only thing preventing you from – crashing or preventing you from passing was the grass like I mean it was like if you got your left sides in the grass but um so yeah I mean it's been around forever but um the closing rate of our cars is really fast I think and uh you know I don't know I don't know how to really define what's right or wrong I think it's more of a dynamic situation I think if you pull off a first block and that one protects your position don't go for the second one because the second one if he's already there he's gonna hook you so Um, that's what I've seen. And and I think that we see uh, there's more talk of it because of the 2019 rules and the spoilers and the aerodynamics. We're, mm-hmm. we're not only talking about blocking at Daytona and Talladega, which mm-hmm. is what we used to mostly talk about, but now it's just about everywhere mm-hmm. where it's really crucial to make sure you, you keep your momentum up. Yeah. Yeah, it's crucial everywhere. I mean, if you get if you come off the corner side by side now and you don't protect that third guy behind you, it becomes – you're a sucker hole for that guy. So, um, you know, I think it's dynamic. Like, as a driver, you can't just say, oh, well, you know, you can't block me because it's going to happen. So you got to be dynamic. Like, you got to fig- you got to anticipate, hey, he's going to block me. Where do I go for my second move? Yeah. I think everything is like drivers have gotten so smart to where the first move is always going to be protected, but the second move is where you make your advantage. So Daytona's in the history books, but man, it was a big night for Stefan Parsons. He got yeah. to make his Xfinity debut, and he that got a awesome. top 12 finish. How happy were you for him? Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, Stefan and I, Stefan Parsons and I have been friends for like seven or eight years now. We raced each other in legend cars, and we the first time I raced against him, like we he came over or I came over to him at Concord, and we started talking, and we just struck up a conversation about the racetrack, and ever since then, we've been really good buddies. And um, it's really cool to see, like, he's got a completely different path than I do to, to NASCAR, but he's making it work. And, you know, to finish 12th in his debut at Daytona, like, that was awesome. And I feel like he's um, on his way to kind of bigger and better things, and he's doing it 
from kind of the grassroots way of working on the cars and, and yeah. putting himself in front of a lot of people. Um, B.J. McLeod's such a great dude. He let him drive his car down there at Daytona, and I think he's going to run Iowa in a couple weeks. How yeah. much do you uh, – are you able to help Stefan and tell him the things that you see and, and what, what maybe will help him go faster? Yeah, I mean, nothing's going to make him go faster. I mean, he knows how to go fast, and I can't tell him that. But, um, you know, I think the biggest thing I try to just, like, give advice on the track and, and stuff since he's never been there. Mm-hmm. But I don't like to tell him how to do things because he's pretty good. And we race at the go-kart track, and, he, keep, you know, we all keep pace with each other. And um, so I don't worry about, you know, trying to tell him what to do because yeah. he, knows, he knows what to do. But uh, try to give advice from what I know, I guess. Right. It was just fun to see him get that chance. Yeah, that's cool. It's been yeah. fun talking about all this racing. The, I saw the other day Bubba Wallace racing a Legends car. That was your yeah. start. Do you ever go back and race any? Yeah, Legends? man, I'm really thinking about it. I um, I practiced out there last week, and um, you know, I was I was pretty fast. So I was like, man, I'd love to go race. But then uh, my crew chief Dennis is um, he doesn't want to go out there because <laughs> he doesn't want to tear up a car. So <laughs> we'll see. I mean, maybe if he if he wants to go, I'll go. Um, but I'm not going to force him to, to go, you know, go race. But I mean, I'm sure he'd love to put a car together and, um, you know, I got to invest the time in it too. So we'll see. Yeah. Would it, would it, you think it has changed drastically since you last did it or would it be like, uh, yeah. getting back on a bike? Uh, it, it changed quite a bit when I got back in it last week. Um, the track lost a lot of grip. Charlotte did. Um, they changed the motor. So it was a different engine. So it was like, a lot less power torque wise, but then more down the straightaway. Um, so it was way different. I mean, yeah. it was uh, it was it was weird. The brakes were different, so we'll see. But it's still still a race car, you know. So right. who knows? I uh, my favorite moments in NASCAR I've talked about on the show all the time. One of my favorite was Daytona, July two thousand one, when Dale Jr. and I had that yeah. big celebration. What what are a couple of your memories as a kid of some of the coolest things you you ever saw in NASCAR? Things mm-hmm. that you will never forget. Uh, that was one, but I was pretty young for that one, so it was not not super like current for me. But um, 2007 Daytona 500, when uh, Kevin Harvick won Mark and uh, Mark Martin were side by side to the finish, and they had the best picture ever or the best video of the start finish line. I don't know how they got that with all the cameras and the lighting it was awesome. And um, and then seeing Clint Boyer flip at the end and the wreck there was just. It was like a scene out of a movie. Yeah, it was crazy. It certainly was, and those cars just just were tumbling like it's crazy. The <laughs> racing we see at Daytona. Yeah, it was wild. That was one, and then um, Homestead, um, the first year that they did the Final Four with uh, Harvick and Newman almost won the race. Right. That was wild. The yeah. drama there was insane. Uh, the, another thing that you were involved in, um, in, I think it was. You have to correct me. I told you I wore that. Funny yeah. looking helmet. Wasn't it 16 when you were involved in the wreck that Christopher Bell flipped on the front straightaway in the truck race? Yeah, I was. was. And the I, I, reason why I brought that up is because you, you'd never been involved in anything, yeah. a high-speed crash like that, I don't think. Mm-hmm. What did that do to you as a, as a young yeah. man saying, wow, <laughs> yeah. that really got out of hand in a hurry? Yeah, that was wild. I've been, I've been on the good side of two flips, like Larson's flip this year and Bell's flip that year um you know I was ahead of it but uh it was the first time I hit the wall full speed like that that hurt I mean it's like you the movement inside the car was insane like it gave me a whole new perspective of how tight my belts need to be and how how well protected I I need to be in the car so um it was way different I hit the wall like 170 I was like wow that's a lot different did you get the data from it and say (laughs) oh wow that's pretty serious yeah that one and then um the hardest crash I ever had was Kansas last year in the cup car. That was that was off four, was, right? Yeah, off four, and I think it was like something like twenty seven G's or something. It was insane. Holy cow! It was, so never do that again. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, tell me your goals from now that you're uh, halfway through the year and kind of mm-hmm. understand where you and Chad are. It's got to be pretty cool leaning on Chad. He he seems to. Yeah. You guys are seemingly getting uh, in a really good spot as you race toward uh, Miami now. What are you, what are you thinking? Yeah. Um, is possible winning races, obviously. Yeah, hopefully winning races. Um, you know that would be the the number one goal is to make the playoffs, which you know is going well right now. But you never know. You got to keep that progression going forward. So number one goal is that to make the playoffs, win a race. Um, you know we had individual goals. We had a goal of winning one pole this year. 
having an average finish of below 15 and leading 200 laps. So we're already at 180 laps, mm-hmm. and we're like 14.7 average finish. And um, and I think the uh, three I think we've had three poles, yeah. Right. So we got to reset a little bit, which is good. So yes. maybe we'll um, go for some more top fives. Love it. Really appreciate you coming by. Yeah. Good Thanks, to see Michael. you. And hey, uh, have fun in Kentucky. Thank you. That's appreciate a good it. State. I like that place. Yeah, I hear you do. <laughs> Well, now that was a lot of fun. I love uh, listening to William's stories, his energy, how thankful he is he gets to do this, and how his career path has just been straight up in NASCAR, winning the championship in the Xfinity Series, and now his first time ever. He's not a rookie anymore in NASCAR. He's running his second year, and we heard his goals. He wants to win a race this year, obviously, and thinks that they can go a ways in the playoffs. So, uh, Thank you so much for coming by, William, and thank y'all for listening to Waltrip Unfiltered. And I want to add something, too. Please go to the NASCAR on Fox Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram, and we're going to put up some good videos. Maybe show that wreck that William's talking about that hurt so bad in Kansas, and maybe the big flip for Christopher Bell that he saw and was a part of in Daytona. But we're going to put all that video up, and we're going to share some insight from the show that maybe you won't see anywhere else. And we really appreciate you subscribing to Walter Unfiltered via your favorite podcast app. And we just would like you to rate us. Give us a five-star rating and tell your friends because I'm loving getting to talk to these racers away from the track. I am loving getting to say hi to them and understand the backside to what their story is when you see them on the racetrack on Sunday afternoon. Hope you're enjoying it as well. And we'll talk to you next week.